that's where Daniel Muller went to school. So he gave them this piece. He gave a wonderful piece of art created by Charles Carmel. Um, Charles Carmel was Jewish, you know, he was from Russia, and he donated a beautiful piece to the Jewish Museum in Brooklyn. So he's been very thoughtful in who got which pieces, and he has given a several, uh, we, we say at least a dozen pieces, we think we may be getting more, but they will be coming to us next week. Uh, Morgan and I are going to be going out to Fresno, California to um, look at the, the potential donations and we will have them packed up and ready to go. And sometime within the next couple of weeks, our collection is gonna grow exponentially because we're gonna be getting quite a, a wonderful donation. And these are really quality pieces. Um, they are pieces created by, we are getting a, a, a Gustav Dens, a, a Denzel flag horse. We are going to be getting a Muller tiger. We're going to be getting an alligator from, from France, I believe, right? Um, we're going to be getting um, a jumping or uh, a jumping or leaping giraffe carved by Charles Luff. Uh Camel. 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 I'm sorry, it's yep. a camel, not a giraffe. Uh, but it, it very unusual figures. And as I said, top top of the line quality um, pieces that will be um, part of our collection. So within the next uh, month or so, you're gonna have another opportunity to come visit us and see the Friels collection when it is here and ready to be exhibited, which I would say is gonna be another few weeks, but um, it, it's very exciting for us. Uh, we're going out there to collect it and pack it up on the trucks next week. And save it from the wildfires. And save it from the fires. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. so Don't, didn't you need donations for the transportation? Yes, we are looking for donations for the transportation. We have received some already, oh, but um, it's, right. it, it is unfortunate that it is in California and requires a very large truck and a very long drive to get in here to Connecticut. So yes, we are looking for donations to help us with the transportation costs. Um, but um, it should be with us within the next few weeks. And that will take us a little bit to get it organized and then it will be on display and we will announce the opening of the new exhibit. Wonderful, okay. welcome. Yeah, yeah. I did try to donate the map, but I got, I was on my iPad and I got stuck in a- In a loop? Okay, I will double check that. Okay, yeah. you guys do Venmo yet? Uh, we do have a Venmo account. Yes. Yes. So I can just Venmo it. So you could Venmo it. Yep. Um, I think it's either the Carousel Museum. Sometimes it's because it's linked to because it has to be linked to a cell phone, so it's linked to my cell phone number. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> right. I know. Well, I guess we'll get started. We do have um, a handful of people online. Can I ask you to hold that for me for one second? Happy, happy. Thank you, my dear. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. My name is Morgan Ergo. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the executive director. I'm delighted to introduce Tom Vaughn. Tom is a former kind of still employee of ours when he began to come through, but he's most widely known throughout the city of Bristol as a fabulous historian. He knows more about Bristol, Plymouth, Terryville, uh, clocks, furniture, uh, <laughs> buildings, architecture. If you want to know anything about our local history, he is the guy that I would point you to more often than not. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited to hear what he has to share with you. Um, he's also going to be highlighting some of the um, other treasures, not just our building, but all of the, the history that ties in together. Obviously, you know, our clock history, the clock museum, we're very fortunate to have, as well as the Historical Society has loaned us uh, this piece right here, which we'll talk about. Um, so I'm excited to share that uh, Bristol has so many treasures that we're so fortunate to have, and um, the more that we can support each other and support them, the, the better, especially during this, this crazy time. So I appreciate you guys being here. If you have any questions at the end, we'll do that. Also, those of you who are online, if you're not sure how to use the chat feature, there's a chat bubble at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the program, please feel free to type in those questions and I'll be happy to read those out for you. Um, we also are recording this and if you're interested, we will post this on our online uh, videos and also on our YouTube page. Um, my computer is very slow at uploading those things, but we will get it on eventually. <laughs> so, take it away. All right. So, uh, thanks, Marty. Yeah. <laughs> 
So I put this uh, presentation together back in February after I found a couple of articles in the Bristol Press Archives about additions put on to the um, Bristol Manufacturing Company. Um, so it kind of started off this whole trend where I went to Morgan a couple times and I said, you know, there's really interesting things about the building that I don't think any of us have ever heard before. And um, some things that were new, some things that we were a little bit uh, familiar, uh, familiar with. And um, I ended up doing a lot of research and I got this whole uh, study put together. Um, I, I made a whole binder basically of information on the museum. Um, that mixed with some interesting findings in um, a local barn that was even more amazing than the newspaper articles I found. Um, but I'll get to all of that. So um, I would argue that Bristol, Connecticut is probably the most important industrious community in the state. Um, we think of Hartford with the coal um, armory that was there. We think of New Haven that had massive clock factories that had Eli Whitney, uh, places like that. We think of Waterbury for its brass industry. But none of these places would have really had um, any form of industries at all if it wasn't for Bristol in the first place. And um, going through the history of the factory and the complex that was here and who started the factory, um, it was really cool to find out that even this building and uh, the factory that was here influenced other communities in the state too. Um, we think of Wyndham or Willamante as the biggest textile production uh, center of the state of Connecticut. And um, it turns out the person who started the Bristol Manufacturing Company is the same person, uh, Lawson Ives, who moved to Willamante and started the textile industries there in the 1840s. So uh, that's a, a really amazing connection, which um, most people really weren't familiar with. Um, so Bristol Manufacturing Company started in 1837. Um, it was one of the longest lasting industries in Bristol. And it was created with the intent of lasting longer than any other businesses without being impacted by great economic depressions. So, um, it really starts with the Ives family of Bristol, and my friend Mary Jane Dapkis is an Ives researcher, and she kind of got me hooked onto the Ives family of Bristol. Um, this is a ten piece made about 1808, and um, it's an eight day ten piece, so it lasts eight days. You wind it once a week, and it's made entirely out of wood. And uh, this clock here was made by the Ives brothers. Um, it was Chauncey Ives, Joseph Ives, Amisa, and Philo. And uh, they started off um, in a button shop up on Federal Hill. So they would turn pewter buttons. Um, they bought the shop off of Titus Merriman, who was a doctor in town, and they converted it into a clock factory where they made these. And this clock is really extraordinary because of the way it's constructed. Um, if, you, if anyone's ever familiar with gears, a large gear is called a wheel, and a small gear is called a pinion. And there's a lot of friction on pinions. So what the Ives family did is they essentially made a ball bearing. Um, that's pretty much the, the best contemporary way I can describe it. That substitutes um, the pinion that was in there. So it's really the first mass produced ball bearing came from the Ives family. And um, right about 1830, uh, Chauncey Ives, uh, 1828, went into business with his nephew Lawson. So Chauncey Ives was making these clocks. Uh, Lawson was his nephew who went into another firm. They started making brass gear versions of these. So um, for anyone familiar with the clock industry in Bristol, um, the earliest clocks were made entirely out of wood, like this one. Uh, they're made out of cherry, mountain laurel, and oak. And uh, mountain laurel is the state flower because it was used so predominantly in the Connecticut industries as a type of uh, timber, as a type of lumber that was used. Um, but the Ives decided we're going to convert to brass, which was really unheard of. Uh, brass had to be imported from England. Um, it was extremely expensive. So they decided by the 1820s, 1830s, there's enough resources here in Connecticut where we could probably set up our own brass mills. Um, that's where you see the birth of the Bristol Brass and Plot Company that would turn into Bristol Brass, which is the whole uh, King Street, Broad Street uh, section of Forestville. All the buildings are still there. Um, so anyways, the brass clock here was a really big hit. And I actually have an original one here. Um, now this one's unique. Uh, it was made by Chauncey Ives and Lawson Ives. They were the ones who would eventually found the Bristol Manufacturing Company. And uh, this one here dates to 1838, so it's actually a relatively late one. And it says it on the label inside that it was made in Georgia, which is really interesting because I bought this clock knowing exactly what it was. I knew who made it. And um, you read the label and it says made in Georgia. 
So I, I did some research into it. Um, in Georgia, you had to pay um, industrial taxes. Anything you produced, you had to pay heavy taxes on. But you didn't have to do that up in the north. So if they made all the pieces up here and shipped them down to Georgia, it was cheaper to ship everything down there and assemble it under its own label that it was uh, assembled there. You didn't have to pay all the taxes. So this was like a, a tax evasion thing that you could, it was like a loophole through the system, which is really cool. So it doesn't have the credit for Chauncey and Lost and Ives, but it was actually made by them. And the mechanism in this is massive. It's a brass mechanism about that big with big brass gears, and it has those metal ball bearing type pinions that are in there. So what happened in 1837 was the Great Panic, which was really uh, one of the first major uh, depressions in the United States. So we think of the crash of 29 being the biggest depression in the United States. The Panic of 1837 was, was a really big deal. And um, you see a lot of clock companies in Bristol uh, face it, hitting it hard, basically. They're uh, closing down, they're not doing very well, so um, they decided to come up with their own idea of something that would be foolproof. It wouldn't be affected by an economic crisis. Um, owning a timepiece back then was having a luxury, um, but everyone needed clothes. So they decided if they opened up a textile mill in 1837, um, they'd be pretty strong. So what they did is they invested um, $45,000 and they got Brian Hooker, who was another industrialist in town, so they all teamed up all their money. Now back then, this was an extraordinary sum of money. Um, in 1830, I think it was 1831, the Terry Homestead on Middle Street sold for like $1,100. So you can imagine $1,100 is probably the equivalency to about $200,000 today. So this was an extraordinary amount of money that they put into this place. And they built a large factory up against Riverside Ave down there. Um, this building was added a little bit later, but it was successful. Um, it really went well. This is a great photo taken from over by the boulevard um, that overlooks the Potomac River. So you can see the river in the bottom, and you can see the massive building that was there. Now, what's so cool about that building is um, many of you guys are familiar with Miner's Farm in Bristol. And you think, how do you tie in Miner's Farm with this massive industrial complex in the center of Bristol? Um, the Miner's Farmhouse was built in the early 1800s and it burned down in the early 1900s and the Miner family rebuilt a new house there. And that's when they really got situated. But the barn was original to the later 1700s, early 1800s. So everything inside of it was from that original family that lived there. And one of the family members was an architect. So it was really cool. Um, Ann Miner gave me a call one day and said, listen, we've got all this stuff in the barn. We'd like for you to give it to the historical society. So we brought this big chest to the historical society with hundreds and hundreds of these blueprints. And we had no clue what they were. Uh, none of them were really labeled, but there was one that was labeled out of the entire box and it was labeled Bristol Manufacturing Company. So um, I talked with some members of the Historical Society and we decided it would better be used here at the Carousel Museum. So we brought it over and um, it's a little bit hard to see in the lighting here, but that's the original blueprint of the building that was here. And um, it was a massive, massive wooden structure building. What's really cool is that this is like, um, it's really like a plan A, plan B type blueprint for um, how it was constructed. So there's one tower, which was supposed to be how it was built. And then next to it, they drew like a plan B tower because it had a tower in the front. And they went with the plan B tower, uh, as you see it in the picture. So it's not what's on the original blueprint, but you can see a sketch next to it, which is kind of neat. So it was just such an amazing find. Uh, we found a couple of other ones that we kind of attributed to the building because it looked very, very similar. But that was the original 1836 building. Um, after it was demolished, um, and I'll go over this in more depth later, uh, you see the footprint of our bottom parking lot. That's where that building was. So that's why the museum's parking lot is tear-shaped. We actually are, we have the foundation that's still kind of there. So, um, all right. Uh, Lisa, do you have the lights again? Thank you. Um, no, that's okay. Yeah, that's that's hanging in the museum. So we'll, yeah. Yeah, this um, this blueprint hangs down in the hallway downstairs now. Um, so this is the Lawson Ives house. I just thought it was a cool thing to tie in. Um, the house was built in 1833. It's a great revival house across from Woodland Street from the uh, Clock Museum up on Maple Street. And uh, it's actually funny because our, our board president, right? That's her office. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. Biondi, that's her, her office now. So um, it's just ironic how the loopholes connect um, different buildings in town. 
uh, together even after hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but loss of eyes in uh, 18, let's see, about 1844, ended up uh, leaving the firm here. He moved to uh, Willamantic and opened up the textile mills there. So uh, he went into business with a couple of people there and that's when it really got big. But it was his experience here in Bristol. Um, they created a factory that survived an economic depression. So he had the experience. When he went over there, other people invested with him and they opened up the massive textile companies that would operate there. Um, so in 1856, uh, Chauncey Ives was the original clockmaker back in the 1800s. Um, he ended up retiring and Harmonious Welsh became the president of the firm. Um, at that time, the stock was raised to $75,000. So it was um, it increased by about $15,000 or $20,000. Um, by that point, the company had moved to Plainville. So they actually doubled their um, production and they built another massive building on Whiting Street in Plainville. And um, that was really the last firm that was still operating out of the Bristol Manufacturing Company name. But I'll get more into that later. Um, 1857 was another economic crisis. Uh, that was the Panic of 1857. Um, there were massive tensions throughout the United States before the Civil War, and the Depression really didn't help. So um, the Atkins Clock Company, a major producer of clocks in Bristol, uh, files bankruptcy. Ian e. Ingram files bankruptcy. Uh, J.C. Brown, who uh, built the entire center of Forestville, he had a massive company there with thousands and thousands of dollars in stock. He went bankrupt and actually had to um, he had to sell his house, uh, which um, he bought off of Lost and Ives. So J.C. Brown lived in the Lost and Ives house later on. Um, so all these companies are closing in Bristol, and the Bristol Manufacturing Company's stock increases. So it's amazing. Uh, the whole concept, uh, 20 years after the whole situation happened, it worked just as it was intended to. So um, they actually managed to open another plant that doubled the size of production, and it, it worked really well. Um, you see James uh, English as president of the firm. And this was a name that kept coming up, and I, I keep reading about James English um, I know he was a clockmaker in New Haven, so I'm trying to get into this. And then in the spring, while I was putting all this together, I was taking the Civil War course because uh, I'm a history major at CCSU. And my professor is talking about uh, the elections for the Civil War with James English. And James English, which I, I didn't really connect the names until I got home and looked it up, uh, was the only Democrat who would vote for the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. And um, that was like, he really did it because he wanted to be governor of Connecticut, and he knew that the Republicans in Connecticut, which were the majority, would vote him into office. So it was, it was a really interesting thing there. Um, he was a, a very important person. Um, and I have some more information on him. But um, he became president of the firm uh, through the 1850s. He retired in 1860 to pursue his career in politics. So this was the predecessor to um, all that great important stuff. Um, he was the governor of Connecticut twice. He was. I was, I was telling Morgan yesterday, I couldn't remember what he was. Uh, he was everything. Um, <laughs> he was a senator. I, I think he was a representative. Uh, no, he was all of them. So um, that was pretty neat. Uh, by the 1860s, um, Elijah Welsh became uh, the president of the firm. And uh, by that time, I mean, his estate in the 1860s was about $3 million. So um, he was the first millionaire in Bristol. Uh, I think his daughter married into the Rockwell family uh, who had due departure. Um, so Welsh was a very important person uh, here. Um, he had business down in New Haven with James English and the New Haven Pot Company. He started off as a blacksmith in Bristol as a, uh, in a very, very poor family. And um, as he worked up the ladder, he went and invested in the brass industry. When the brass industry expanded, he invested in the clock industry. When J.C. Brown went bankrupt in 1857, he bought the whole factory complex, rebuilt it, expanded it, and opened the E.M. Welsh Company. And this is one of Elijah uh, Welsh's timepieces here. This one's made about 1855. It's an eight day steeple clock. Um, this design was designed by Edward Ing uh, Elias Ingram from the Ingram Clock Company, if any of you guys remember Ingram's over on North Main Street. <laughs> and, um, so this is a, an Elijah Welsh timepiece. And uh, this is one from my collection at home that I thought would be a great thing to bring to this uh, exhibit so you guys could see something that was actually made by the president of the firm of this factory. So really what you see are all the people who are in charge of this factory. They're not people experienced in textiles. They're not people experienced in early style carding mills or old style traditions. 
These are all big businessmen. They're investing into a company that they know will be successful. They know the workers can handle it. And that's how it worked. And it paid off for all of them. So um, except for Elijah Walsh's son, um, which was a little bit of another issue that I'll get to. So this is James English. Uh, he was born at New Haven in 1812. He died there in 1890. He served as Senator of Connecticut from 1875 to 1876. He was the 43rd and 45th Governor of Connecticut. Uh, he was a member of the House of Representatives from Connecticut's 2nd District. Uh, he was a member of the Connecticut Senate. Um, he was the final say for the vote in the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, um, which actually he was applauded for. They got him a standing um, ovation for him voting in favor for it because he was the final say. It was a very close vote, and he's the one that voted in favor of abolishing slavery. Um, and then he saved the New Haven Clock Company, which was bankrupted by P.T. Barnum, the circus guy. And that's a whole other story, which is, which is really incredible, but we're not going to get into that one. Um, <laughs> Elijah Welsh. Uh, was also a senator of Connecticut. Um, his obituary in the Bristol Press in 1887 was like two pages long. So um, it was really great to read this, this awesome story about him. Um, but I pretty much said a lot of this information here. Um, he was president of the firm here until he died. So he, he, he really worked up until the very end. Um, so continuing the timeline of the factory that was here, uh, by this time period, we're still in the bottom parking lot. There was a massive building which uh, started right about here and worked about a thousand feet up the road. Um, there was a river and a canal that was dammed. It was called Roots Island, which was behind where the post office used to be. If you guys remember the old Bristol post office. Um, there was an island back there and the river was dammed up and it actually flowed parallel to the railroad tracks, went underneath the building here and flowed into the plant. And that's how they had water turbines to power all the machinery. Um, by the later 1800s, uh, if you look at the old maps, we see an electric plant opened up, which ironically is next door. And um, for anyone who works here, we all know that there's currently an electric plant next door, which is completely <laughs> unrelated. It just so happened that after 100 years, a new electric plant popped up in the same spot. But um, it had its own train tracks. So as we know, the railroad runs right behind the building. So there is a railroad line that went down to drop off coal for the electric plant that was there. And um, you don't see the river on the maps anymore because they had their own coal-powered um, electric plant there. Um, James Hart Welsh took over the factory when his father died, and uh, James Welsh took over two factories when his father died. He took over the Bristol Manufacturing Company here, and he took over the E.N. Welsh Company, which was the biggest uh, million dollar industry in Bristol, uh, which was in Forestville at the time. Um, so what happened is James Hart Welsh was a uh, um, notorious horse race gambler. Um, he gambled away the entire family fortune in about three years. Um, bankrupted the E.N. Welsh factory, which um, as soon as it went bankrupt, a uh, fire burned down the whole building. So if you guys ever have time to look in the fire museum here, there's pictures on the walls that Hat Barnes put together of the Welsh factory burning down. And it's an extraordinary uh, picture of a fire. Uh, the story goes that it melted the railroad tracks on the ground that ran through the factory building. Um, so it's, it's a really amazing fire. That also didn't go over well with the bankrupted factory because at that point there's no insurance. So um, there's all this issue going on. Um, he basically, he died right after. And I can't find, I couldn't find his obituary. I don't know how he died, but it's he, he died really young um, and almost immediately after these big major catastrophes in his life where he gambled away the entire family fortune. Um, so by 1902, uh, when Walsh dies, we see F.G. Hayward, who became president of the firm. And I was going through the records of the factory that were here that I could compile, and you see this name pop up going back to the 1870s. Um, F.G. Hayward was a manager here. Um, he was a night watchman at one point, which means he went through the factory buildings at night to make sure there were no fires. Um, it wasn't security like a museum, um, like we have today. Um, it, was, it was fire security. If the fire showed up, he was in charge of making sure the fire was extinguished on the plant. Um, and that's why we have all these cool fire doors around the building, too. So this guy was working here for a long time. Clearly he worked up the ladder because he made the factory so um, impressive and he got the stock to grow so much that he raised the money to build this plant as an addition to the main plant in the bottom parking lot. So um, here is the earliest map I could find of a complex, which is in 1884. These are through the Sanborn maps, which are fire insurance uh, maps. Uh, these are made so you know 
Um, how many sprinklers are put in the building? Does the building have water pressure? I know it's the later 1800s and we don't think of water pressure being a commodity, but um, a building four doors down at the time had water powered elevators that still work today, the Sessions Company. So um, even without electricity, those elevators still work. So you can see that the Potomac River, uh, Riverside Avenue goes right through here. They kind of didn't draw the street on the map because that wasn't the point of this map. The point was to show the buildings. Um, so you see the river coming from Main Street area, flowing into the building. They don't map an, an X plug, so they, it doesn't show where the water goes. So I don't know if they were using it in boilers and evaporating it for, for water pressure for steam power. Um, I really don't know. But you see um, the main building up against the street. Um, by this time, we have the second plant, which was built where the water department building is today. Um, that was a wooden building. There is a brick building built where the electrical plant is today, over there. And um, they have a couple of storage buildings across the street. Um, here's a great picture. This has got to be my favorite picture of the factory. It's such a clear, um, crisp photograph. And it's taken right down there, right outside the windows, uh, looking towards Main Street. And you see the office for the factory is right there. Every Victorian factory had this big creative terracotta style um, brownstone factory uh, office in the front. So um, if you remember Eagle Lock and Terry will have one. Um, Sessions in Forestville still has theirs that's still standing. Uh, Bristol Brass has one right on Broad Street. It's a gorgeous brick building with terracotta tiles on it. Um, that was ours, so it's a tiny one, but it did the job. And uh, you have the massive loading dock. This is where you literally would pull your wagons up and load up all of your shipments to the dock. Uh, you see the tower sticking out of the back. Um, that's the tower that's on the blueprints there um, on the original sketch I found in the barn. And then in the background, you see the tower for the um, powerhouse, which was the electrical plant. So um, I'll talk about that in a minute when I get to another photograph. Um, so what I found in the Bristol Press was a 1901 article that was bragging about how F.G. Hayward uh, completely redid the entire factory. Um, he, was, he was quoted as a shrewd businessman, which I guess is a compliment, because the factory did so good they built this plant. So we find, um, I actually have the article. Um, a 60 by 150 foot building, 18,000 square feet, was constructed behind the original wooden building. So uh, that's the building that we're in today. And this is actually the whole Whole building. It would have been open and there would have been a uh, line machinery going through for carting and spinning. So there's a carting mill on the first floor and up here was spinning where they have uh, spindles spin the cotton into thread for um, making into the textiles that they were doing. Um, 1907 plant three is added and I was trying to figure out where plant three is uh, because when you look at the maps there's only plant one which is down there. There's plant two. This was became plant two. Uh, I finally found it on one of the Sanborn maps. Um, there it is. It's listed on the map here as plant three. Um, it's the addition on the building. So we think of this as one solid building, but it's actually two buildings that are stuck together. And that's how it was constructed. So I found this great photograph on a map, which is right over there. And this Emily Talion, who is, who is a lady in Bristol, who's a very good friend of mine, gave me that map years ago. And I was trying to find a picture of the factory. So we're trying to find out what year this building was built. Um, the town records say this building is 1836 or 1837, um, because that's the date on the factory. They're not going to, um, when all the buildings get torn down, they're not going to know which building was built when. So we always have that, that strange date. Um, so I'm trying to figure out when it was actually built. And I found it on a map. And uh, the joke on that map is there's this big black stain along the bottom of the map. And it's, it's coming out of the smokestack, which is our powerhouse over there. So we're like, wow, of all the pollution, it, it came out of our, our powerhouse over there. <laughs> it just goes right across the bottom of the map. So it's kind of a, a funny little thing to see over there. But um, this gives you a better view of our building up here. This is the brick building that we're in. We're right behind those windows right there. Uh, this is the main plant that was built in the 1830s. That was the wooden building. Uh, this building is still across the street. It was part of Stately Forest for a long time. And um, you see the office building there. And they even put a little train in the back. So you can see the, the train line that we have railroad access. 
Um, what's really cool is in this photo, you can just faintly see it. There was a massive sign on the front of the building here that read the Bristol Manufacturing Company, and it gave a description of all the things that they made. There was also a 5,000 gallon water tower right on the corner of the building there. And if you guys all take a look right up there, you can see um, three, four I-beams, which are built into the building. And those were always interesting to me because they look original. Uh, the way the bricks are carved out, those are definitely, uh, they've always been there basically. And I always wondered why they were there until I saw this picture on the map. Those supported the 5,000 gallon water tower that stood on top of the building. And the water tower wasn't for drinking water, obviously, it was for water pressure for sprinklers. So um, on these maps, the sandware maps, um, particularly there's a description here of how many sprinklers the building had. Well, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but those were to power all the sprinkler lines that went through the whole building uh, before they had electric uh, water pressure and pumps. Um, this is in the basement of this building, and uh, it was, there's like a hole in the floor that you can climb down this scary <laughs> little ladder. And I went down there about three or four years ago, and I remember it being much higher, and I, and I think I was just shorter. But, um, yeah, I went down there yesterday because I wanted to get this picture to show you guys because the way this building is built is just so cool. Um, I went down there, it's like this high. <laughs> so I was squatting down and I, I, I squat stepped the whole 150 feet of the building from one end to the other. You're insane. this dark, uh, scary little space. But um, what's really cool is you, you see the, um, the architectural components of the building. And um, I really wanted to go into architecture growing up. I was always fascinated by how buildings were built, um, especially very old buildings. And uh, this building never screamed 1836 to me. It always screamed Victorian. I was thinking maybe 1870s, um, post-reconstruction period uh, from the Civil War, where factories up here are starting to expand again. Um, I didn't think it would be as late or as recent as 1901, but that's backed up by the, by the newspapers. Um, the granite, the foundation of the building all the way around is granite block. And it's not cut granite block um, like you'd see in earlier constructions. It's like granite rubble that is fit together. And there's a little bit of cement in between. But when you guys leave, if you take a look at the foundation of the building, it's all cleared away and you can see it really nicely now. You see these granite blocks that are all, uh, you can see a couple of drill marks where they broke the blocks apart. Uh, but they're all kind of funky shapes that fit together pretty cool. And that's how the building is held up. Um, it's a brick building. You have probably 30 or 40 feet of brick resting on the ground. So granite is a nice hard rock. That's what they use to hold it up. And when you go in the basement, you see the same thing. So this building, um, it, it's really a tapered construction. As you get down, uh, as you get lower from the roof, the beams get bigger, the supports get bigger, and uh, the posts all get bigger. So um, up here, you see these beams are about eight by eight inches. Um, up on the ceiling, they're about eight by 12 inches. Um, right below us, the beams that hold up this floor are about 16 by 16 inches, and these are about 12 by 12 inches. So they almost double in size as you go to the floor below us. Um, below that in the basement, the beams are about probably 16 to 18 inches wide, and they're massive. They're big, huge beams that all connect. And um, what you see up here are braces that connect the beams together. So you have one, two, three. Um, there's a fourth one over there. Um, in the basement, they didn't do that because these beams were so big, they could hold their own weight. And in order to hold them up on the ground, they built this brick pillar. And because of the amount of weight on the brick, the brick would crumble. So what they did is they uh, cut a big granite slab and put it on top of these pillars. And that way the granite wouldn't crumble and the brick would hold up. So it's a great way of architecture. It's a, it's a great way of supporting the weight of all these buildings. So when you look around this floor, and when this, when this uh, projector uh, screen is in here, you can see how many of these there are. There's a lot of them. Underneath every single one of these downstairs is another pillar that's even bigger. And underneath that is one of these columns. So I crawled down there yesterday just to photograph that for you guys. <laughs> um, What's kind of cool is we found this uh, piece of textile, uh, or I found it because it was, it was in the sand down there. Um, it's probably made here. Um, I, I'd almost bet that this was made here. Um, it's a cotton glove 
uh, probably left by a worker who was working on pipes or something down in the basement or examining the structure of the building. And uh, we compared it to the textile that we have on exhibit here. And it's fairly similar, it's not identical, but it's, it's probably made here. It would be unusual that a factory of this size producing so many tens of thousands of textiles, um, you wouldn't find something they, they wouldn't be using something that they couldn't make already. So I, I'm pretty fairly confident that this here is made here. Um, it's, it's such a, a raggedy little thing to pull out of the basement, but it's cool. It's, it's really interesting that it came from the building. Um, there's not much here that is original to the original building as far as machinery or artifacts. We really have the shell of this big gorgeous building. Um, here's another picture I found, which I thought was fairly similar to that first one uh, taken down there looking that way, but it actually shows an even bigger building here, uh, which is where the water department building is. And um, I always thought that the water department building was part of the trolley line that operated because they had a big building here on the um, Riverside Ave. I thought that was it, but I guess it wasn't because this building was standing way up into the 1920s. And um, so that was another massive factory building that I didn't even know about until I found this picture last week when I was going through one of my other resources. Um, so in 1923, uh, the factory is closed. Um, I don't know why. I read through probably hundreds and hundreds of Bristol Press articles months and months before that. Um, for a company that was doing so good that they added an 18,000 square foot brick complex only like 10 years earlier, um, something must have happened where the company started to close. I don't know if it was impact from World War I. Um, that's what ties in uh, this uh, textile artifact we have here. Um, which you'd think World War I, they're making all the textiles for the soldiers. You'd think they'd have a boom, but it didn't really happen. Something happened, and I, I haven't been able to figure out what that is, but the Bristol Manufacturing Company is closed. Um, I found a great article in like 1918 about how beautiful the building was and how the original wooden building dating back to the 1830s was still there. And it was a treasure that should be cherished for the rest of Bristol's history. And, um, the year after they, they tore it down. So it's, it's really interesting. Um, but I'll talk about this textile here now. And um, this is courtesy of Bristol Historical Society. Um, Lisa Bell, um, who's in charge of textiles at the Historical Society, is an extraordinary uh, textile conservationist and researcher. And she could point out, she could pull out any piece of fabric from any time period and tell you where it was made, what it means, who would have worn it, and why. And it's just amazing. So. Um, we read about the stuff that was produced here uh, at the Bristol Manufacturing Company, and it was satinette and knit underwear. And um, I'm trying to figure out what that means, because you hear knit underwear and it kind of sounds like an awkward uh, title. So I asked Lisa, I was like, do, you, do we have any knit underwear in our collection? And like, it's, it's an awkward thing to ask. I don't want, like, are we, am I thinking about contemporary underwear, like undergarments? I, I really wasn't knowing what to expect. And she goes, yeah, I've, I've got one pair. So um, she brought me into the textile room where she was working, and this is right on top. Um, this is a pair of knit underwear. Um, basically, what we'd call it nowadays is, is sweatpants and a sweatshirt. Um, <laughs> I was pretty surprised. Or long johns. So, or long johns, yeah, yep. Uh, really amazing. It's, it, this, this is really held up. It's, it's a really good condition textile. Um, it feels really good. I, I imagine over time the textile has broken down a little bit and the fibers have, have kind of changed your feeling, but I'm sure this was exactly like sweatpants as we think of today. So that's what was being made here from 1836 until uh, 1923. Um, this is just an extraordinary thing and it's an amazing condition. So um, special thanks to the Bristol Historical Society for loaning this to us for, for this talk tonight. Um, it's just a really cool thing. After the talk, I, I encourage you guys to go and take a look at it because it's a really interesting thing. I wasn't expecting that that's what knit underwear was. I was expecting something scratchy and uncomfortable, and that seems pretty cool. What is that? What's the fabric? Um, it's cotton. So it's just spun cotton. Um, or satinette is um, an earlier name. Um, every time I typed it into Word, it, it comes up as, a, as it's not a real word anymore. Uh, but it's an early type of textile, very similar to woven cotton or woven linens. Um, so yeah, um, 1924, the year after, um, so basically it was only a couple months, the Plainville plant closed. So uh, they moved the headquarters to Plainville, because remember they had that massive company on Whiting Street there. 
um, that division closed the following year. So it seems like they tried to stay open. It definitely wasn't something where it just shut down. Um, they definitely tried, but they couldn't do it and the company closed. So 1924, Noble E. Pierce purchases the property uh, for the lowest bid of $100,000, which is a lot of, that's a lot of money today to pay for a, a really defunct factory building. Uh, but back then that was an extraordinary amount of money. Um, so he bought it, um, he was part of the Bristol and Plainville Electric Company, which operated um, next door. So uh, what happened is the powerhouse for this building turned into an electric company that actually powered the trolley lines, um, which for anyone familiar with carousel history ties in the history of this complex with the carousels. Um, you have the electric power that was going into the Lake Compounds carousel was being produced as a, at a plant right next door, which started off as the powerhouse for this building. So that was a cool tie-in that I found there. Um, 1927, the mortgage is taken out on the building by Walter Wiss of New Britain. And um, so basically he somehow inherited the building. There's another thing that happened in there. He ended up with the whole complex. Um, that's when I find that article on how important the building complex is and how sacred it is to the history of Bristol. And then you find an article in 1933, the plant is foreclosed on, uh, Wisp failed to satisfy the court, which means he couldn't come up with the money to pay for the building. And um, the building was demolished. So, uh, but this building, which was at that point only 15 years old uh, or 20 years old was saved. So uh, th and this is plant two and remember plant three, which is the addition connected to this building, which makes it one solid structure. So um, while the rest of the factory building was destroyed, um, the storage building across the street was saved and is still standing today. All the wooden structures were taken down. And um, what you see, which is really cool, are the scars of the original building. And the biggest scar you'll see is the bottom parking lot. That's the foundation of the factory. Um, what you also see are these gorgeous granite uh, boulders that litter the grounds all around our parking lot. And those would have been the foundation stones for the original 1836 building that stood here. Uh, they have period quarry uh, drill marks you can measure the marks. This, traditionally, the smaller the drill holes go, um, the earlier in, back in time the, they were drilled. And these are relatively small drill holes. Um, so these are all over the place. And they're kind of cool. They're like ornamentation to our gardens now around the, <laughs> the museum. But those are parts of the original building. Those are the granite blocks that would have held up the old factory. This is the Plainville plant on Whiting Street. Um, there's this. Uh, it used to be Whiting Street, now it's, it's got a different name. Um, but that's basically where the storage company is. There's a big storage facility um, in Plainville, right before you go underneath the uh, highway and where Walgreens is. This is on the other side. GE. So GE is there. Okay. <laughs> um, so that was the other Bristol Manufacturing Company. And it says, uh, Bristol Manufacturing Company established 1856. That's the year that the Plainville plant was built. That's the year Elijah Niles Welsh incorporated all of his money into the plant. Um, and makers uh, knitting mill for knit underwear. So it's another one of those really cool things that was painted right in the building. I don't know when that was demolished. I don't really know anything about that plant. Um, so end of an era, this is where I go into um, demolishing the facilities. The original 1836 building parallel to Riverside Ave is demolished. Um, the contract for wrecking the structure was given to Charles Burberry and Sons um, of New Haven. So they came up and demolished the building. Um, I found an article that was around Christmas time of 1836, uh, no, 1933. And um, it said that the building, it was like the next day after they started it, was already leveled. So they, they really went at it and leveled the whole structure. Uh, by 1945, the only buildings left, like I said, is plant two, plant three, which is part of this building, and the storage building down there. And that's when Ray Trek Knitting Mill, which um, was started off in Watertown, Connecticut, decided to relocate to Bristol. And that's the company that we were all familiar with uh, that operated here. So Ray Trek Knitting Mill came in 1945. Um, they set up, uh, I have pictures of the spinning room that was up here, and I wish I put them in this presentation. Um, they're in one of the Bristol picturing uh, history books, uh, picturing Bristol history books. But uh, um, there were uh, lines that went across the floor here and that spun the uh, cotton fiber into string. And we actually have a gentleman who worked here today, um, which is really impressive. Um, what's your name? 
Jerry Wilson. All right, so you used to work here, right? Yeah. Yep. When it was um, the knitting mill. When it was the knitting mill. Yep. Uh, what years did you work here? Well, we're guessing like 1950. Oh, okay. Like, All right. Like 16. So, what sort of things were they making at that time here? Making nylon and rayon big folds of, of uh, material. Oh, so big schemes of fabric, basically big, big industrial walls. So. So glad you're here. Yeah, he has, he has a little interesting right. story. Can you tell? Yeah, yeah. I'd love for you to tell, tell the story. Tell the story about what happened. We had those the big folds of like linens and on rolls, big rolls on, right? Well, we were in here working around, right? A woman caught her dress in that big roll <gasps> and it was wrapping her right into it. So luckily, because I was working with material, I had these little scissors and I could go over and cut her off right off. Cut the dress or she would have been pulled yeah. right into the machine. Well, was, wow. wow. She was right up against that. We would take that wind, wind. Yeah. Wow. Just wow. Cut her free. And, and I bet you went right back to work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like no yeah. Wow. Incredible the story. German people started this. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wonderful. Um, Great story. So it's got it's got to be really interesting to be in this building after so many years yeah. and seeing the changes and, and how it evolved from an industrial complex into a, into the museum we have today. So thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. All right. And then um, by the 1980s, uh, Ray Trek Knitting Mill closed. Um, the building was used as a storage facility for a while. And that's when we start to get our first-hand carousel experience in the building. So um, Bill Finkenstein from Bristol um, ended up opening up a small carousel restoration department here where he was doing uh, conservation and restoration projects here. Um, the carousel museum basically opened up in 1990 um, in a small portion of the building here uh, with just one horse. And that was the Lake Compounds horse, right? Which we have downstairs, uh, which was off of the original carousel at Lake Compounds. Um, so since then, um, the museum became a nonprofit. Um, that was a big step in establishing the museum here as, as a legitimate uh, museum. Uh, Louise DeMars was made the executive director. And in 1998, the next change on this site is um, the New England Carousel Museum got a grant from the State of Connecticut and Roberts Foundation to purchase the building. So by that time, we have the next uh, step and the next uh, chapter in this complex's history as the New England Carousel Museum. And um, we're joking on, uh, I was joking with Morgan yesterday and uh, back in February, on uh, how Morgan fits into this whole <laughs> history here. Uh, because we're talking people who were the first millionaires in Bristol, uh, the first people to really develop a ball bearing, uh, the people who voted for the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. And Morgan, you fit right in because <laughs> 2018, Morgan Ergo succeeded Louise DeMars as executive director. And, um, I'll take it. <laughs> so we, we can joke, Morgan's got the connections to James English. Yeah. And, um, all those great, important uh, political figures of the 19th century. <laughs> um, so that's pretty much it for the history of the building. Uh, but I think my favorite thing to go through were the Sanborn maps uh, to see how the factory complex changed over time. Um, you see, this is the earliest map that you guys have already seen with that long building that's in the blueprint here up against Riverside Ave. Um, I tried to organize these all together um, to a similar scale so you can see how the complex expanded. You see that river coming out, which is called, it's called a mill race. Um, it's a raceway. That's where water is elevated in a canal to flow into a building to supply water power. Um, this is 1895. Um, you see the development of a couple of brick buildings. On the Sanborn maps, yellow is a wooden building. Uh, which is a fire hazard. Brick buildings are colored in a, a salmon color. And you see the brick building across the street that's still standing, which is uh, Stanley Floors. By 1900, uh, this is 1905, you see the massive addition of that 150 by 60 foot building, that 18,000 square foot brick building, which is our building that we're in today. And um, I always thought that the um, 
earlier building was pushed down more. And I never realized that uh, the building here was really the edge of the complex. This was pushed way up in the back corner of the whole site. Um, that factory building made it almost all the way down to Main Street. And that's where the, uh, the power plant was. You still see the canal. So by the time our building was built in 1901, um, the canal is still being used to water power the lower building. You see a tank on the roof, capacity 5,000 gallons, in the bottom right corner, which is right there, uh, underneath the I, above the I beams there. Um, and you see all these other buildings that are built. Now, what's cool is there's a bunch of houses to the right, um, which go all the way down to uh, the intersection down there by the brick building. And those were all houses built for factory laborers here. Um, I kind of cut them out because they weren't really important. You can see one there in the corner. It's part of the same property uh, block. This is um, 19, this is 1920 at that point. So you see the addition of Planet 3, which is connected to our building. Um, now when you guys leave, if you don't take the elevator, if you take the stairwell, uh, which was recently restored, you can see the original wood stairs, which are gorgeous. Um, if you look at the wall, you can see where the original staircase was. I was trying to figure out, before that building was built, how did they get to the second floor? I mean, we have access through the back road to get to the second floor up here, but that would be awfully laborious to have to get out of the building. Now, there's a brick building here. So if you exit the first floor, you have to walk a whole way around the complex, go all the way up the back road there, and get into the second floor from there. So if you look at the old map I had, there is a wooden staircase that went outside the building, and that's how they got up to the second floor here. Um, if you're in the stairwell, you can see what's called a zipper. That's um, an architectural term for where there used to be an opening in the brickwork. When they put a new, uh, when they patched it, when they filled it in with new brick, uh, the bricks don't integrate. They go up against each other. So you see a straight line that goes down to the floor. That's where the doorway was where the stairwell originally went outside. And you can see it in that great uh, picture on early 1905 map over there at Bristol. Um, when they built that plant on, they added the stairwell, which is original, it's never really been changed, and the elevator shaft. And um, here's one of the later ones. This is 1925. Um, you see the power plant here. And by now the river's gone, as you can see, it's not on the map anymore. There's a massive power plant. You can see there's an electrical and steam pipe uh, steel posts which go through. Um, they probably go underground to supply uh, power for the new building, or the old building. Um, at this time, you see they added its own railroad track, which goes down uh, to drop off coal for the boiler house. Um, this building became the electric plant which would power the uh, Bristol Traction Company, which was the railroad, uh, the trolley company in Bristol. Um, you can actually see in red up here uh, the old Masonic Lodge, which was a massive brick building next to, uh, they just painted the mural on. Um, the building was there, and that's what's left of the edge of the building, supporting the other building next to it, the Lorraine uh, Shoes building. So I think this is the last um, picture I have from the map. But uh, uh, right after this, right after this map was taken in 1925, um, all the buildings were demolished except for our building up here. And it's cool because you can see the, the water towers there. Um, you can see the closet, which uh, we have key rates all these and stuff in about this building here in the map. Uh, you can see the stairwell, you can see the elevator shaft. It's really, really cool. So I'll, I'll, the, um, I'll go back to that cool picture I have. Of, um, there it is. So in our building, if you look carefully, this is blown up compared to the map. You can see that little wooden staircase that comes out outside. It's one of the neat little things. So when you leave, go down the stairs if you can and look at that, that zipper that's there. Um, so that pretty much sums up the whole presentation here on Bristol Manufacturing Company and the origins of our building um, and the origins of the museum. Are there any questions? Did you ever find out who the architect was for this museum? So I found, it's in the article who the architect is for the building. For this building. Um, yeah. Um, find it, here. Um, it was brought through by F.G. Hayward, who was the president at the time. Um, 
William Winstead, um, L I N S T E A D. Um, he was the contractor um, hired to put the whole factory building together for this building. So William Lindstedt, if we look into him, we'll probably find more information. Um, I don't know what his architectural connections are to the Hill family that left the Blueprints and Miners farm, but um, it's pretty neat. So that's the name of the guy that built this building, particularly. So. Do you want to just talk about the um, catwalks, the doors to the catwalks? Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So if you guys go outside, uh, when you go out to your cars, um, there is one major catwalk, which is on plant three over there, and it's the farthest corner of the building. If you look at the door, that door is different than all of these doors. You see these big red doors inside the museum here. There's a wooden one over there, and um, those would open up so that they could bring machinery um, through pulley systems into the factory on the second floor. Um, if there are excessive goods produced, and you had a big bale of goods, you needed to get it out. You shift it through those doors. Um, over at the end of the building, if you look, you'll see two pieces of an I beam sticking out of the bottom of those doors. And that was a catwalk that connected to another brick building right across the street, uh, right in the lower parking lot there. Um, and they actually connected. So you can go into um, you could go into every single building on this plant, and there were a lot of them, without ever going outside um, because those catwalks were uh, erected to go through them. And this was a second story one, so it must have been cool back in the day. Uh, I always fantasized about going through one of those old factory bridges that go over, over streets. Uh, many of you guys might remember the old Ingram ones and New Departure ones on North Main Street in Bristol. Uh, those were like really, really big ones. Uh, but yeah, we had a couple of those. So if you, if you go outside and look, you'll see all the doors. And way down there is where that original catwalk was to get into the other buildings. Uh, the door is massive. It's a massive door with a massive hinge. I had it open this summer because it was so hot in there, <laughs> but it just like opened and it's like on the ground. I've done some work with eagles. Okay. And in order to pay me, they gave me watches. Oh, no. They yeah, paid you in watches? Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, they gave, Ingram gave a watch, I think, to every, every World War soldier. They gave them a watch. And that was one of the things they do. That was right on North Main Street, um, right past uh, New Departure, which is on the left, on the right, all the way up North Main Street, uh, was the Ingram Company. And what's really cool is we actually have the steam whistle here in the Fire Museum co uh, collection from Ingrams. Um, it's a four foot high, probably about that high, steam whistle with a clock mechanism attached to it. And the clock mechanism was just so that you could, it was, it was manual, um, it just supplied uh, power when you needed to push the lever to make it whistle. And my favorite story about Ingrams um, is there was Michael's Jewelers on Main Street and they had a big clock in the storefront window. And um, the guy that was in charge of blowing the 12 o'clock whistle, uh, um, he would walk by the window and adjust his watch to the Michael's Jewelers uh, clock in the window. And um, back then the 12 o'clock whistle was the shift change for the whole city of Bristol. That's when schools would go on um, their lunch break. That's when factory workers would split shifts. You'd usually work a six to 12 hour shift. You'd work from six in the morning until 12 o'clock. And then uh, the new laborers would come in and work 12 o'clock to six o'clock. Um, or you'd work the whole day and that was just your lunch break. That's, that's really what you got. So um, the 12 o'clock whistle was very, very important. Um, city meetings were held on that whistle. It, it was critical. So this guy walked into Michael's Jewelers one day and he asked them, he said, how do you keep your clock so regulated perfect? It's always perfect on my watch when I go and check it. And they say, oh, we regulate our clock off of the whistle at Ingrams. So, <laughs> uh, the clock could have been running slow. It could have been running fast. Um, the thing could have been an hour off. And that, that guy was walking by and adjusting his watch to that clock. And then he'd go and blow the whistle. And, that was, and they, they both work off each other. So it, it could have been two in the afternoon and Bristol was celebrating 12 o'clock. <laughs> I love that story. Um, I actually got to meet the guy, which was really, really cool. Um, he, he stopped by the museum a few years ago. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. All right. So that pretty much sums up the whole presentation here. Um, take a look at the artifacts I brought in. Um, you have clocks that go back 200 years, textiles that go back over 100 years, and they're all connected with, with the history of our building here. Yes. All right. Thank you, Thank you Tom. Thank you.
You're getting a round of applause online too. <laughs> so for those of you who are on, online, I did record this and I'll be sharing it on our website. Oh, you even got a, you got a hand clap emoji. Oh. <laughs> um, and if you are interested, please leave me your email address. Or I have your email address, but if you are interested um, in being emailed Tom's presentation, I'll be happy to share that with everyone. Um, I will go throughout and um, show you some of the fire doors and some of the architectural details if you are interested in, in staying on. All right, any questions from folks online? Very interesting, thank you. You're getting, you got some people from California and you have some people from Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. All right, all right. <laughs> so I'll just take you over to see some of our fire doors. Um, these are original fire doors here. They are counterweighted. Let me see, this is a little bit on reverse, but they are counterweighted here. Um, it's a little hard to see, but if the fire rope burned, this door would slide shut. I am, I don't wanna go into the hallway because my internet is unstable, but um, I will share also pictures of our stairwell too. This is a map that he referred to that is from 1907, the map of the city of Bristol. And you can see very clearly there that large plume of smoke. <laughs> that is coming from our building. <laughs> uh, we were definitely not environmentally friendly back then. And I'm gonna try to go up to this. This is the picture of our complex here. Let's see if my camera can focus on that. Our building here is the one in the back with the water tower. So you can kind of see Riverside Avenue and the river in the front there with the train track going behind it. I'll come back here too. This is, um, the original floor plan or the original architectural drawing that he was talking about. It's a little hard with the glare there um, of the picture. It's a pencil, hand-drawn pencil drawing from 1836. And we do have the original postcard here is the uh, photograph of the original building that was torn down in the 30s and 40s. Here is the uh, textile that was made here, probably around World War I. It's in wonderful shape. It's very soft. Has some buttons here. It's definitely a high-grade sort of military piece. Um, but it's in wonderful shape. The Bristol Historical Society does a wonderful job uh, maintaining all of this. Not a moth hole in it. What I think is really interesting and what Tom and I were discussing was that of the 200 years or 100 and something years that they were creating here, almost nothing has a Bristol manufacturing tag on it, which I think is very interesting. It was all very generic and shipped out in bulk. So, wonderful. Well, thank you guys very much. Oh, I'm just gonna try to oh, say hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Nice to see everybody. Nice to see you, Art. Um, and if you have any questions for us, you can uh, uh, email me and I'll be happy to uh, email you all of the information that Tom went over. Thank you guys.